Thank you, Kate, for the scripture reading. Morning, everyone. It's a privilege to um, welcome you all to um, Armadale Church this morning. It's a privilege to welcome some of you back for quite a while. I'm looking at my cousin from all the way from Mandurah and glad to have you join us uh, this morning. And welcome back um, to our uh, pathfinders as well. I trust you had an enjoyable time down at your, your campery. Since the last time we, we met, I've had the privilege to visit family all the way in Sydney. And uh, that was my first flight for in almost uh, 18 months. Can't believe that. Can you believe that? All thanks to COVID-19. Uh, the only impediment to the trip was I had to wear a mask uh, all the way um, from the minute you step at the airport and then you board the plane, you keep your mask on. And uh, well, you are, you are willing to, to um, go to that length if needs be in order to see family, isn't it? Yes. And I think that the biggest challenge that, that COVID-19 continues to pose to human beings around the world it's precisely the, the challenge um, we've not able to see and visit with family. And I can, I can empathize with so many of you whose relatives probably are over there, uh, not only across Australia, but across international borders. And we pray uh, for those borders to open. How many of you would like the borders to open? Soon, maybe we should have a petition sent to our premier. And, and indeed, it's almost like with COVID-19, it's, it's one step forward, two steps back, isn't it? But these are the conditions in which we live. The world in which we live is indeed a world that is full of uncertainty. But we pray that, that indeed, by God's grace, we will be able to move forward and possibly, by His grace, uh, put this, this pandemic behind us. Family. I'd like to reflect this morning on, on um, the privilege that we have to be all part of a family. God intends us to be in families, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm so happy that all of us here we are part of, of uh, families where even cats and dogs get along, isn't it? You have those, those ads on TV where you have boys and girls, and it would, it would seem like there is nothing wrong with, with those picture-perfect families, isn't it? And you wish you, you looked like them, you wish your family was one of these, where, where kids do what they are told all the time. Well, well take, take, take heart, because, because when we open Scripture, it's anything but. When we open Scripture, it's anything but um, uh, husbands and wives, boys and girls, moms and dads, and, and, and children and parents, it's anything but People getting along all the time, isn't it? Yeah. When we open scripture, we can relate to it because it presents us men and women, boys and girls, who struggle with life. Who are not always smile uh, to each other. They have struggles just like us. And I'd like to reflect precisely this morning on, on the relationship between a father and a son. And I've entitled our, our sermon this morning, Sons and Daughters, because that's who we are all, sons and daughters of a living God. The story is told of a Spanish father whose relationship with his son, whose name was Paco, 
His relationship with his son Paco had become strained. And eventually the relationship that the father had with his son Paco had shattered. So much so that Paco decided to pack everything he had and he ran away from home. And when his father noticed that, that his son Paco had, had run away from home, he, he began a long and difficult search in order to find his son. And so, having looked for, for a while, he, 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 he had no success. And at the end of the day, desperate as he was, he thought he would place an ad. He thought he would place an ad in the newspaper, uh, the, the, the local or the national newspaper there in Spain, in Madrid. He would put or buy maybe a, a, a full page ad and on it he wrote this. He said this. The ad read, Dear Paco, please meet me in front of the Hotel Montana, Tuesday noon. All is forgiven, your papa. That ad appeared in the Madrid newspaper and the father prayed that Paco, his son, would stumble and read that ad. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the second book of Samuel. I'd like to um, welcome those who are joining us uh, on the live stream and also on uh, uh, 87.6 FM. If you have your Bibles with you here or at home, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the second book of Samuel, chapter 18. There is brought to our um, notice intention and, and a quite moving story. It's the story of a king, David. And it's the story also of a son, and a strange son. His name is Absalom. There in, in 2 Samuel chapter 18, the context is the following. David, King David, is on the tower. And he, he sees his troops um, going out to war. He not only sees his troops going out to war, but in the distance he also sees the troops of the enemy. But this time, somehow, the enemy looks different. The enemy that that David is looking at doesn't look anywhere like, I would say, the traditional enemy like the Philistines, far from it. Why? Because, because the banners that are being displayed by this approaching enemy look quite different to those of the Philistine army. And as the troops get closer, uh, one can, can Notice that these, these men approaching, taking on uh, David's army, they look just like us. They look like Israelites. And as you, you use your binoculars and you zoom in and you look even closer and you zoom in on the faces of the enemy, it looks like the one who is leading this this rebellious army, if, if, if you, you look closely, that general, that commander-in-chief, 
looks like looks like Absalom, David's own son. Maybe you 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 recognize him with his a uh, free flowing hair. And and as David notices this this enemy troop approaching, his heart his, his heart sinks. Why? Because David knows. David knows his men. David has trained his men. David knows that his men are ruthless soldiers. David knows that the, his men will spare no one when it comes to the enemy. And somehow, somehow, deep within him, his heart sinks because he sees that his own army are marching against his own son. David may be king, but first of all, David is a father. And his heart beats for his son. His heart bleeds for his son. And David, maybe for the first time, he, he would say, uh, he would send a word of caution. And if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read verse 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 18. Here's David. Scripture says, 2 Samuel chapter 18 verse 5. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Etai. David says, be gentle with the young man, Absalom, for my sake. And all the troops, scripture says, heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. I find those words very moving. Those words allow me to think that, that David did not whisper in the ears of his commanders. But David shouts. David says, be gentle with my son Absalom for my sake. As if David wants everyone to hear his, his love. He wants everyone to hear the compassion that he has for his son Absalom. And remember, Absalom at this very moment is a rebel, isn't he? At this very moment, Absalom is leading a civil war against David. And David is not ashamed to cry out to the rest of his troop, I still love my son, spare him. For me, don't kill him. Why? Why does David plead for mercy for his son Absalom? First, like we say, it's because, because first of all, David the king is a father, yes or no? And as a father, his, his heart beats for his son. His, his heart bleeds for his son. Yes? Absalom is a rebel. And maybe he, he left his hair uh, grow long just to show how rebellious he is. Some fathers and mothers can, can relate to that. Or he would, he would, he would color his hair a different color, <laughs> just to show I'm different. But David still loves him. David does not condone his unruly behavior. David doesn't say it's okay. Don't worry, no. David knows that. David knows that his son has gone a bit too far this time, but somehow, somehow, David still hopes to spare him the ultimate punishment. No matter what he has done, Absalom 
is still his son. Moms and dads, if there's one thing that I can learn from this story so far, is that our children need to know that we love them not for what they do, but we love them for who they are. Because at the end of the day, the God of the Bible loves me for who I am. He doesn't love me for what I do. You know, there's, there's a credo and some confession that says that God rewards those who keep His commandments and He punishes those who doesn't, those who don't. I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to the idea that God winks at sin. I don't subscribe to the idea that God, that, that God winks at unruly behavior. Far from it. But at the end of the day, I like to think that God loves me not for what I do, but God loves me for who I am. No matter what I have done, no matter where I have been, I am still His son. I am still His daughter. And David prays, David prays that, that, that his, his commanders will hear his prayer. But David pleads for Absalom because somehow David knows that it is not all Absalom's fault. If you have time this afternoon after our meeting at 2.30, I'll remind you, if you have time at home during this week, read the context of 2 Samuel chapter 13. There you will see that something terrible happened to Absalom's sister. Something terrible happened. And, and Absalom, who, was, who, was, who had witnessed, who had, who had heard what had happened to Tamar, his sister, the beautiful princess, Absalom had hoped that David the king, whose job was to execute justice in the land, Absalom had hoped that, that when David hears what's happened to, to, to Tamar, that he will render justice. And he waited. Absalom waited for two years. And David did nothing. At first, Absalom was angry, but then his anger turned into resentment. Someone said that anger, oh, oh resentment is anger with a history. That's why scripture says, make sure you don't go to sleep with anger in your heart. Why? Because the longer you deal with your anger, the anger will turn out into resentment. If you have something against your brother, or if your brother or sister has something against you, says scripture, go there and make peace with them while you still can. Don't let grass grow over it. Two years Absalom waited, nothing was done, and Absalom now turns into the rebel that he became. It's not all our children's fault, you know. And Paul says, Father, do not what? Do not exasperate your children. And David, David wished, David wished that he could turn the clock back. David wished that he could turn the clock two years back and then he would execute justice. But it was too late and all he can now is, is to pray. All he can do now is to, to plead that they will, they will spare Absalom. As the rest of the story we know in 2 Samuel chapter 18. As Absalom is riding his, his mule, with his hair free flowing, somehow he's, he's riding under an oak tree and his hair is caught in the branches of the oak tree. And there, young, fair looking Absalom, who was a half-robe maybe, 
scripture says that Absalom is hanging between heaven and earth. His hair having been caught in the branches of the oak tree and he is helpless. And as Absalom hangs there between heaven and earth, his hair caught in the branches of the tree, someone tells Joab, the commander of David, who had heard David's plea. Someone says, Joab, do you know what? Uh, guess what? Absalom, the leader of the civil war, he is caught there in the branches. And, Ab and Joab said, what did you do to him? Did you strike him? And the man said, you far from me to do such a thing. Joab said, how foolish you are. Then we read in 2 Samuel chapter 18, you have your Bibles with you. This is what Joab decides to do. Even though he had heard David's plea. 2 Samuel chapter 18 verses 14 to 15 we read. And Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So scripture says that he took three javelins in his hand and he plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Joab thought that he was doing David a service because he had killed the rebellious son, because he had killed the sinner. And all this time, and all this time, David is pacing on the tower. All this time, David is waiting for news of the battle. And in those days, they did not have smartphones. In those days, they didn't have satellite uh, 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 phones or, or live stream, whatnot, on the battlefield. In those days, you had to run from the battlefield back to, to the village, back to the city, to bring news of the battle. So David paces the tower. He goes, he, 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 is, he looks deep in the horizon, waiting for news until at some point he sees somebody coming from afar. He sees some dust in the distance and David says, somebody is coming. They must, he must be bringing good news. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 18 verse 24. Indeed, Scripture says, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 24, While David was sitting there between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall, and as he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it, A man running! Man running! And David says, If this man is running, he must bring good news from the battlefront. And David's heart is now pounding. David's heart is beating again, louder in himself, wondering what news this man will bring about his son. And the king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the man came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another man running and he called down to the gatekeeper, Look, another man coming, another man. The king said, he must be bringing good news too. Maybe he wants to catch up with the other one to be the first one to break the good news to me. <laughs> we live in hope. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimaaz, son of Zadok. Oh, David says, oh, I know Ahimaaz, he's a good man. So if it's Hasim Ahimaaz who's running, uh, I know him, he must bring good news. Verse 28, then Ahimaaz called out to the king, all is well, 
he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up the men who lifted their hands against my Lord, the king. Oh yes, um, Ahimaaz is trying, as we say, to, to, um, to drown the fish. He's trying to hide the, the, the tree from the forest, or the forest from the tree. But the king asked, I'm not concerned about the troops. I am concerned about one person. I want to know what's happened to Absalom. So verse 29, the king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me your servant, but I don't know what it was. Ahimaaz is not uh, stupid. And verse 30, the king said, Ahimaaz, stand aside and wait here. So Ahimaaz stepped aside and stood there. Then the Kushite arrived. My lord the king, he said, verse 31, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all those who rose up against you. And again the king says, King David says, I have only one concern. It's not about winning the war today. It's about how my son is doing. And David asked again, verse 32, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. And the news is that Absalom has been struck dead. And scripture says that at the news that his son, Absalom the rebel, at the news that Absalom the sinner had died, David is devastated and in one of the most touching passages in scripture David exclaims in verse 33 of 2 Samuel chapter 18 if you read with me the king was shaken he went up to the room over the gateway and he wept Scripture says that as he wept, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son, the rebel. Oh, Absalom, my son, the sinner, I wish I had died instead of you. And I wonder whether this is precisely why David is called a man after God's own heart. Because when David cries and weeps over his dead son, the rebel, the sinner, there is a picture of a God, of a father who weeps when any one of his sons and daughters dies in rebellion. And if any one of us, if any one of us thinks that we're doing God a favor while putting them down in their rebellion, think again. God does not rejoice when the sinner dies, far from it, what the scripture says. God weeps each time one of us dies in our rebellion. God is not in the business of driving people away from his kingdom. But God is in the business of bending over backwards, saying, my son, my daughter, why would you die? Because God's desire, God's desire ever since the fall, is to dwell among us. 
God never, God the Father never rejoices when the sinner dies. And this morning, over every person who, who possibly dies in his or her rebellion, God says, my son, my daughter, I wish I had died instead of you. And guess what? My son, my daughter, I have died instead of you. That's how far God's love goes. And he did it for all of us. Not because we were good boys and good girls and our hair very well too. While we were still sinners, Scripture says, what did God do? God died for us. While we were hanging between heaven and earth, our hair, uh, uh, no matter how long it is, what color it is, while we were hanging between heaven and earth, in our rebellion, God died for us. And the good news that the Bible brings, the good news that David was hoping for, Jesus brings the good news, says Jesus saves, God saves. So that you and I, we can have eternal life. I don't know where you are in your walk with God. I don't know where you have been. I don't know what you have done. But one thing I know is that God's heart breaks for you again this morning. Just like David, just like David's heart ached and beat for his son, God's heart beats for yours and mine. Paco. Remember Paco? Yeah. The rebellious son. You see, Paco is a common name in Spain. And when that Tuesday at noon, the father who had placed an ad in the newspaper in Madrid pleading with his son Paco to come to meet him there at noon on Tuesday when he turns up at noon Tuesday he finds 800 young men waiting their first name all of them is Paco <laughs> There were 800 young men there in Spain, all over Spain, <laughs> who needed to hear that message, all is forgiven. Wow. Come home. Amen. And I believe this morning that every one of us, we are a pack of Every one of us, our name could be Absalom. And we don't know, maybe, but one thing we long for is to experience the grace of God. All of us, deep down, we long, we long for, for a true home where we can be accepted, loved, and cherished for who we are. We have this long view in our hearts because God's Spirit whispers to us to come home. And this morning, my brothers and sisters, God says to us, wherever you be, Whatever you've done, all is forgiven through the death of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you and I, by His grace, we can read that ad in His Word. 
we can answer him and say, Lord, here I am. May God bless us. Is my prayer for you and for me today. Amen.